Okay, let's move to um, the uh, the 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 documents cases. Um, where what what is the next um, sort of like I guess likely uh, case to be adjudicated that Trump is facing? The most likely is the D.C. case uh, based on the January sixth events. So the Jack Smith special counsel indictment based on the conspiracy to overturn the election, basically the, the January 6th allegations. That's the most likely of the remaining three and the chances of that one going to trial before the election at this point are very slim, but it's, it's still not impossible. Um, but the other two, Georgia and Florida, look almost impossible at this point to get the trial this year. At the Florida case the, the, in, partic uh, in particular, yeah. right, because Judge Eileen Cannon is b uh, giving a hearing essentially to every claim that's made to slow walk it uh, so that it doesn't happen before the election. Yeah, that's been an extremely frustrating case to watch. It's a real failure of the system, um, you know, that, that the judge, if, if you put a judge in place, or if the judge is on the case, that is... Uh, determined to sort of slow walk it, uh, there's very little that the prosecution can do to, to counter that. And, you know, this is a case that before a more experienced, you know, impartial judge would have been to trial by now already. It's not a complicated case. Um, but because of the amount of time she's taking to resolve every tiny little issue, as you know, she's now postponed the trial date indefinitely. We don't even have a trial date set in Florida. And, it, you know, just no way it's going to happen this year the way the way it's proceeding is that an experience um, or is it is it impartiality well you know it, it's hard to judge for certain from um from out from outside i mean and uh, so i'm a little reluctant to assume bad motives but it, it's uh it could be a combination of experience um you know incompetence <laughs> And and impart and partial and uh, being part you know trying being partial to Trump being tr trying to deliberately tip the scales and which one of those do you think it is or in what proportion you know there's a lot of varying Could views but I think there is pretty pretty universal opinion that it's been inexcusably slow um, is there no for whatever combination is, yeah. is there no mechanism for the prosecution to basically circumvent Cannon and say, um, uh, you know, go to uh, the appellate court and say, this is something's amiss here. There is, uh, they can go to the 11th circuit for what's called a writ of mandamus, like a, you know, an order from the 11th circuit to order her to act in a certain way. And when they do that, they can ask the court, they can ask the court of appeals to reassign it to a different judge. Um, that's a really extreme, remedy that doesn't happen very often. And one of the frustrations about what's been going on here is that Cannon's been, again, whether through luck or, or deliberately, kind of avoided issuing the kinds of orders that might lead to that because it's just been scheduling stuff. You know, it's just been, you know, take the time she's going to take to consider motions and then sitting on motions for months before deciding them. But she's not issuing the kind of you know really clearly legally wrong adverse rulings that then might justify the special counsel to take her up to the 11th circuit and say, by the way, she's demonstrated this pattern of, you know, bias on the case, uh, improper ruling. You really should remove her. Um, he doesn't want to do that until he's got a really compelling case for it because he's probably only going to get one shot at that. Right. You know, you don't want to strike, don't want to strike the king and miss. Right. Um, and she hasn't really given him yet the, the, footing to do that, right? The kind of ruling that might, might allow him to do that. Do you think that she would have, uh, do you think that's dumb luck or do you think that, uh, or do you think, uh, she has a savvy that maybe we don't know of, or do you think that it's possible that she's, uh, got access to, uh, uh other people's savvy about avoiding that tripwire, uh, that might have the 11th circuit say, okay, now we have something substantial in which we can act upon. Yeah, I mean, I guess any of those are possible. I, I don't know how we would know, right? Right.
Um, well, I mean, I guess I also am curious, too, about, uh, so, you know, Trump wins, right? If you could just reiterate to our audience what would happen to these two Jack Smith cases um, and what the future would be and why it's so important for Trump that the two federal cases right now are being <clears throat> delayed. Right. I mean, that's what's been so frustrating about the whole thing. We're in a unique situation where a criminal defendant is potentially going to be in a position to cancel his own prosecution. I mean, that has never happened before. And you know, that was one of the arguments for urging the Supreme Court to act really quickly on the immunity question. You know, people suggest that oh, it seems kind of improper to ask them to keep the election, you know, keep the political calendar in mind when they're deciding why should they speed it up just because the election's coming. Well, the answer is th there's never been a case like this before where if the defendant wins the election, he can cancel his own prosecution. So this needs to get resolved before he potentially has that power. Uh, you know, the people have a right to have these charges tried and we can't just assume it'll happen in 2017, uh, 20, 2017, uh, 2025, if, um, if he wins the election. So yeah, if, if he wins, he will have the power as, uh, you know, head of the executive branch to order the Justice Department to drop the cases, uh, the federal cases, um, and that you'd expect almost certainly will happen. Um, he could try to pardon himself, um, you know, that's untested, but, and may become unnecessary if he just drops the cases. Uh, unclear, the effect on the state cases would be less clear. I mean, certainly at the New York case, if he's convicted, there won't be much of anything he can do about that at that point. He might be able to get the Georgia case at least put on hold. I think there'd probably be a pretty persuasive argument that a state can't criminally prosecute a sitting U.S. president while they're in office. Um, so maybe that gets at a minimum delayed for another four years. Um, so he can definitely do a lot to thwart his own prosecutions if he wins re-election. And that's one reason it's, it was so important to try to get these resolved before that took place. Um, uh, just getting back to the January 6th case in, uh, in, in D.C., which um, he, he appears to be the only one with any serious potential of having, you know, resolution prior to that. What, um, like, w just give us the contours of that and what, what, what would have to be proved and, uh, and, and what the, the charge, what he could be convicted of, I guess. So there's um, uh, four main charges. There's a conspiracy to defraud the government, which is basically a conspiracy to interfere with the lawful functions of, of the federal government. In this case, a conspiracy to thwart the legal counting of the ballots on January 6th, right? That, that everything that happened leading up to January 6th with uh, Trump and his unindicted co-conspirators and others was part of a plot to thwart that government function where they certify the election on January 6th. So that's conspiracy to defraud the government. Um, there are two, two charges related to obstruction of the congressional proceeding, uh, which is again, very similar. Um, trying to thwart Congress from counting the ballots properly or, or send false information to Congress in the forms of uh, phony electors and things like that. And then a conspiracy to violate civil rights just to deprive people of their right to vote by taking the, the votes of citizens in those seven states where they came up with this uh, phony electors scheme and trying to uh, you know have their votes basically thrown out or not counted. So all the counts are basically uh, based on the same set of facts. It's, it's the entire scheme between the election and January 6th that used different mechanisms, the, the phony electors, the pressuring, you know, state officials, the pressuring of Mike Pence, um, you know, the, the, the calling, um, uh, you know, testifying falsely before various state proceedings about so supposed election fraud that didn't happen. You know, all these different steps combined are part of this scheme to overturn the election and, and thwart Congress on January 6th. So that's the real, to me, has always been the most important case, the most fundamental one, you know, really about the assault on democracy itself. I mean, the classified documents case is important, but it's not in the same category to me um, as, as this one, this really fundamental assault on democracy, you know, fighting the, the peaceful transfer of power, trying to, to overturn the election results. That's the most significant case. And Georgia is based on the same allegations, basically. Um, but the D.C. federal case is 
better chance of getting to trial in New Hampshire. Is that D.C. federal case, I mean, what do you need to establish here for a conspiracy? Because it, my understanding of, of a conspiracy charge is that um, you don't necessarily need a lot of, of I guess, um, a huddling between the different members of this conspiracy. But what you need to them to do is all be acting in a manner that is sort of in somewhat in concert to... Um, to commit this uh, crime of like uh, interfering with the normal function of uh, the U S government. So if Donald Trump sends Rudy Giuliani to uh, file a court case on uh, you know, in, in, in one state that that is, is at least in part evidence of a conspiracy. Is that, is that, is that right? Uh, and um, how much does it play into it that like, in Arizona, let's say, if Rudy Giuliani is found guilty of uh, of, uh, of uh, a fake elector uh, in Arizona, how much of that is you know implicates Donald Trump? Yeah, so it all the the heart of a conspiracy, any conspiracy charge is the agreement, right? So what you have to show is the agreement among the defendant and co-conspirators, whether they're charged or not, to commit a certain offense. Now they don't have to succeed, which is kind of the the beauty of a conspiracy charge, right? So the, obviously they didn't succeed in overturning the election, uh, but that doesn't matter for a conspiracy. It's the it's the agreement, the criminal you know undertaking, the joint undertaking together. And once you're in that agreement, then the conspirators are responsible for what their co-conspirators do, right? So once they've formed this agreement uh, between the president and Giuliani and Mark Meadows and all the others that were allegedly involved, then if Rudy Giuliani goes to Arizona and pushes a fake elector scheme, all the other co-conspirators are responsible for that. The partners in crime are responsible for each, for each other's actions. Um, so then the tricky part, like you suggested, is proving the agreement, right? Because can Donald Trump just kind of sit back and, well, I was just sitting in the White House and these people were off doing things on their own. Not unlike the defense in the New York case that just concluded, right? I mean, part of the def suggestion is Cohen and uh, Michael Cohen and uh, Alan Weisselberg and others were just cooking this up on their own and, and Trump wasn't really involved. And especially when you've got someone who famously doesn't use email, you know, doesn't like to create a paper trail, proving that he was part of the agreement can be challenging. But I, I don't think it would be too difficult in this case. I think there's going to be enough evidence of these Oval Office meetings and things like that where all these different schemes were, were cooked up. And, uh, you know, agree agreements are often proven by circumstantial evidence, right? I Meaning, the example I would like to use for my students is, you know, if, if you and I get in a car together, put ski masks over our head, go into a bank together, rob the bank with guns, and drive away together in a getaway car, what are the chances that that was all just a big coincidence? Right? <laughs> Zero, right? Obviously, right. we had an agreement to rob the bank. but you, And you can ask a jury to find that agreement existed. We had a conspiracy to rob the bank, even if neither one of us testifies that we ever sat down and made this agreement. The agreement can be inferred by their actions. And that's sort of what the government would do here. And there's a recording. Like, I mean, the, I under, the, the agreement, yes, has to be proven, right? But there's a recording of Donald Trump saying, I need you to find, I forget how many votes it was. But oh, yeah, 11,700. Right? Yeah. And that's only one very small part of the case. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's plenty of evidence like that, uh, you know, recordings or emails back and forth between other people or Oval Office meetings, like I said, where these various plots were hatched out, things like that. There's, I think the evidence of the January 6th case is very compelling, you know, um, it just has to get to, they just have to be able to get it in front of a jury. What is the, uh, the biggest impediment right now to uh, this uh, case starting in earnest, I guess? The Supreme Court. Um, the whole thing has been on hold for months while we wait for the Supreme Court to rule on the claim of presidential immunity. And it can't proceed until that's resolved. Um, they could have taken it quickly. They could have acted much more quickly than they have, and they didn't. And so now we're all just waiting to see, are they going to at least fast track it and maybe decide it in May? Or, you know, I guess May is almost over, but maybe, you know, before the end of the term, are they going to wait until the very final day of the term? The longer it takes the Supreme Court to act, the harder it is for Judge Chutkin in D.C. to then get the case sent back to her, resolve any remaining questions, 
that the Supreme Court opinion might raise about, you know, do I have to decide whether some particular acts in this indictment maybe can't come into evidence due to immunity, whatever, you know, um, and then go forward with the trial. But she has said in the past that once the case comes back to her, she's going to give Trump about three months to get ready for trial because that's how much time was remaining before her original trial date when everything got paused. So she's but basically... Can I, can I guess... This isn't when binding, the Supreme, this is what she's said. What's can that? I guess when the Supreme Court is going to come out with their, with their ruling in that yeah. case? Or let me, let yeah. me rephrase it this way because I do ask this question of all, all uh, 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 law professors that I've had on the program. We've had a lot. Um, but I'll ask it in a slightly different way. Uh, to use your example that you give your students about the, um, the ski masks, um, do you think it's a coincidence that in this instance, the Supreme Court is taking this long to address this uh, uh, this question of of presidential immunity 